Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the minor prophets in our continuing survey of the Old Testament. First, I'd like to tackle the topic of eschatology. That word eschatology just means the last things, and we're going, going to back up and look at the eschatology of Moses. You see, Moses didn't have the entire Bible. He'd only been uh, given those portions that he wrote and the prophecy of which he was aware from the very beginning, way back in the book of Genesis, uh, you have a prophecy given in the Garden of Eden that there would be a continuing conflict between two seeds, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Now, from our perspective, we can look, look at the seed of the serpent. We can say, wait a minute, that's, that's speaking of something spiritual, that, that's Satan, and, and that would be correct. And that prophecy talks about how uh, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman there would be a struggle and the seed of the serpent God says to the serpent he will bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel that's not a lot of prophecy to go on it's it doesn't uh, make it absolutely clear if you'd been living back then we can see more of it from our New Testament perspective also Moses had a prophecy uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, that there would come a prophet who would be like Moses, a prophet in the future who would, like Moses, had spoken to God face to face and who would give the law, and they weren't sure exactly what else he would be like, but he would accomplish those things, and, and people would listen to him. Finally, also in the book of, this time in the book of Leviticus, you have a series of prophecies when you get to Leviticus chapter 26. And it describes if you follow the Lord, then he's going to bless you. But if you don't, if you turn away from him, then he's going to bring cursings and troubles. And and if you turn back to him, then all that will go away. But but if it does, if you don't, he'll curse you seven times worse. And then more things happen. And if you turn back to him, then that's fine. But if you don't, it's seven times worse. And you have five cycles of that. So there are a series of of escalating judgments, each one worse than the one before, that are promised upon the people of Israel. And finally, when it gets as bad as it can be, the very, the, the very worst thing that can take place is that they will be removed from the land. But then, right at the end of Leviticus chapter 26, it does not end there. It gives a promise that even if that takes place, if they repent, then God will return them to, la to the land. He will plant them again in the land, and they will be in the land again. Now, when we come to King David, we have the, we're building on the same prophecies that we saw at, at Moses, because he, he had the writings of Moses. But he, in, he adds to that two prophecies. One, that there would come a priest who would be in the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalm 110, verse 1. Verses 1, and actually it's the whole psalm. Um, so that there would be a priest, not from the Aaronic priesthood, but from a much older priesthood, uh, no details are given as to what that looks like or who that would be, but there would be a priest, and we've already seen there's a prophet like Moses. And then God also promises David that he will have a descendant who will sit upon his throne, and it will be an everlasting kingdom. So a prophet, a priest, and a king, that is all seen in the eschatology, uh, eschatology of David. Now we come to the eschatology of the pre-exilic prophets, that is, the prophets who lived before the Babylonian captivity. One of the themes that we see in those particular prophets, it's not going to be limited to them, but we see it introduced now, is the theme of the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord sounds, you know, just, well, gee, he's going to have a day, could that be a party? No, the day of the Lord is always has the idea of judgment. It's a serious, sober, somber sort of approach. God is going to judge uh, his people, and he's going to judge the world, and that judgment is called the day of the Lord. After that, and Isaiah is going to talk about this, uh, there is promised a new heavens and a new earth. So there's judgment coming, but then after the judgment, there's hope for the future with a new heavens and a new earth. Now, when we get to the prophets of the exile, we take those same two themes, the judgment and the new heavens and the new earth, 
And there is added to that something up close and personal because now they are being taken away into captivity. The, this is seen in Ezekiel and Daniel as they are actually living through, Jeremiah as well, they're living through the actual exile as the um, this had happened in 721 BC where the northern kingdom of Israel had already been taken away into captivity and now the southern kingdom of Judah in the year 586 BC is taken into captivity and Jeremiah in particular has a prophecy that says when 70 years have been completed for Babylon I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. That's Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 10. So this captivity would be 70 years in duration. That hadn't been given way back in the book of Leviticus when it talked about being removed from the land and then being returned. No time frame had been given. Now that time frame is given that there would be a 70 year captivity followed by a return. Alright, let's move on to the book of Hosea. That's the book of God's covenant marriage. Hosea chapter 1 verse 1, the word of the Lord which came to Hosea the son of Bere during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash king of Israel. Notice we have both the the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. They are both coexisting at this time. And it's a time, economically at least, when everything is wonderful. It looks like nothing can go wrong. Uh, Jeroboam is the, um, economically speaking, the best king that Israel has seen. Now, spiritually speaking, he's not. Uh, spiritually speaking, things are very bad in Israel. But folks aren't concerned with, with spiritual. And that's the problem. Verse 2, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. If you haven't guessed by now, this is going to be one of those R-rated uh, Bible studies. Um, Hosea is told to go and take a woman of ill repute, and marry her, because the relationship between Hosea and his unfaithful wife will mirror the reflection it will reflect the relationship between God and unfaithful Israel verse 3 so he went and took Gomer the daughter of Diblaim and she conceived and bore him a son so notice this is all in the midst of this harlotry that this is taking place and the Lord said to him name him Jezreel for yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. Now, Jezreel means son of God. Uh, this, uh, this king Jehu, when he'd come on the scene, when he'd become king, he had sown a lot of bloodshed. And God says, I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. The Valley of Jezreel is this valley that intersects the central mountain range in Israel. And a number of famous battles had taken place here. This is where Deborah fought uh, the people of, of Hatzor. This is where Gideon fought the Midianites. This is where Saul fought the Philistines and had his fall. Uh, this is where Joram and Ahaziah uh, had met their end at the hands of Jehu, the, whom we just mentioned. This is where Jezebel was killed also. And so all of these things had taken place on this, in this valley, this wide open valley of Jezreel. You can go there today and it's a, it's a beautiful, lush, fertile valley where you have farmlands. And, and it was that way back then too. It was considered the breadbasket of Canaan. We come down to verse 6, Then she conceived again, and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Name her Lo-Ruamah, for I will no longer have Racham, I will no longer have compassion. That's what the word Lo-Ruamah means. It means no compassion. For I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel, but uh, or that I would ever forgive them. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah, and deliver them by the Lord their God 
and will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. You remember when we talked about uh, Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, we saw there the deliverance of the southern kingdom of Judah. When the Assyrians came down to try to take Judah, uh, their king, in contrast to the king of Israel, the king of Judah, Hezekiah, turned to the Lord, and the Lord delivered the city and, and delivered the land. Verse 8, when she had weaned Lo Roma, she conceived and gave birth to a son, and the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami. I already said the word Lo means not. Ami, Am is people, and Ami is my people, so uh, name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people. Imagine having a child and you name him not mine. Um, and this is what's uh, being reflected here. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Even though I chose you, you're not acting like my people. There's no family resemblance. So, so evidently you're not my people. I'm going to treat you like somebody else's people. I'm going to remove you from the land. We get to verse 10, though, and there is hope at the end. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it, was, where it is said to them, You are not my people, it will be said to them, You are the sons of the living God. So there's coming a day when the people that, that of whom it was said, You aren't my people, you now will be called sons of God. That's our story, isn't it? After all, uh, those of us who are, are not Jewish by birth, we have come to the place where we can be called sons of the living God, even though there was a time when we were not called his people. But now we can be called his people. We are called sons of the living God. Verse 11, And the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together, and they will appoint for themselves one leader, and they will go up from the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. God's going to do a wonderful sowing. Um, back in that day, it was a, it was a terrible sowing, sowing judgment, but he sows something else in the future, and we are the product of that new sowing as the seed of the word has been planted throughout the world. Hosea chapter 2 verse 1, Say to your brothers Ami and to your sisters Ruama, remember the names, Contend with your mother, contend, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. And let her put away her harlotry. She, you see, even though Hosea had married this gal, she's not acting the part of a wife. She's going with other lovers. She is not my wife. I'm not her husband. And let her put away her harlotry from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. Verse 3, Or I will strip her naked and expose her as on the day when she was born. I will also make her like a wilderness, make her like desert land, and slay her with thirst. This is what God is doing to to both punish but also to turn the heart of his people back to himself. Verses 4 and 5, Also I will have no compassion on her children, because they are children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink, as if, as if, all those other lovers are going to take care of her. Quite the contrary, those other lovers are going to be the ones that bring her to ruin. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up her way with thorns. This is God speaking. God's going to, to put a, a roadblock in front of her. And I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She will pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them. And she will seek them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband, for it was better for me than, uh, it was better for me then, than now. This is the story of the prodigal son, only related to the unfaithful wife. And notice, the tragedy, the trouble, comes to turn her heart back toward her husband. Verse 13, I will punish her for the days of the Baals when she used to offer sacrifice, sacrifices to them and adorn herself with her earrings and jewelry and follow her lovers so that she forgot me, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor, 
The word Achor actually means trouble, it was, but it was an actual valley. Uh, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope, and she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. Now, the valley of Achor, as I said, that's, that's actually a place in the, the northern kingdom of Israel. That's the place where um, Joshua, uh, after they had fought the battle of Jericho and won, and then they tried to fight the next battle, and they lost. And the reason they lost is because one of the Israelites had taken some of the property uh, from the spoils of Jericho. And when it was discovered that this had brought defeat, when the sin was discovered, then Joshua, we read Joshua chapter 7, seven verse 24, then Joshua and all the uh, Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zer Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor, and he was put to death there. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? Why have you achored us? The Lord will trouble you. The Lord will achor you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones. And they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Now, here's what Hosea is saying. Then I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door. It's going to be not a door of trouble. It will be a door of hope. I'm going to turn her trouble into hope. Even though she's been disobedient. Instead of, instead of a judgment that, that kills, it will be a judgment that returns her heart. Notice the contrast, and it is a contrast, between Achan and Jesus. Achan was guilty. Jesus was the one without sin. Achan, his sin brought defeat and death upon the nation. Jesus, his obedience, going to the cross, brings victory and life to the world. Achan was put to death for his sins so that the nation could partake in victory. Jesus was put to death for our sin so that all can partake in victory through faith in him. Now, Hosea chapter 2, verse 16, and it will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me Ishi. Ishi is the, uh, Ish is, is the word for man. Ishi, my man, sort of like my husband. And no longer call me Baali. Now, these two words are actually synonymous. They, they are both used for, uh, for husband, both Ishi and Baali. But there are shades of meaning. Like I said, Ishi means my man, husband, you know, is the idea, but my man, Baali, means my Lord. Verse 17, For I will re remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, so that they will be mentioned by their names no more. We get to chapter 3, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I bought her for myself. Now, we're not sure how, how this took place or why this took place, but it appears that, that Hosea's wife had departed from him, playing the prostitute, and then had found herself up for sale as either a slavery or is this a, a prostitution thing we're not sure but he goes and he purchases her verse 2 so I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver he actually got her for a deal uh, and a homer and a half of barley and then I said to her you shall stay with me for many days you shall not play the harlot nor shall you have a man you're going to stay with me but we're not going to be living as husband and wife because I need to make you faithful again. And God says, I'm going to do the same thing with Israel. I'm going to bring my people back into the land. But I will not be with them. Not in that up close and personal way that I've been in the past. And instead, I'm going to keep you in the land, but I'm going to keep you faithful so that one day you will be ready to be my faithful bride. Notice, nor shall you have a man, so I will also be toward you. For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. They're going to do uh, without all of those things so that they can be ready to meet their king, the Lord. 
Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness. When does this take place? In the last days. Now, we have present unfaithfulness described, and Hosea is going to speak quite a bit about this. Then there is the promise of upcoming captivity followed by a eventual return, not just physical, but a spiritual return to the Lord. Now here's our overview of the entire book of Hosea. Chapters 1 through 3 give Hosea's marriage. Chapters 4 all the way to the end of the book really give Hosea's message that is based, illustrated, by his marriage. So Hosea's marriage and then Hosea's message. In chapters 1 through 3 we saw Gomer's unfaithfulness, her discipline, the promise of her restoration. As we come to chapter 4, we see the case of God's covenant lawsuit that is set forth. It's showing how Israel has been the unfaithful bride, how Israel has been, has broken the covenant, has been unfaithful in that covenant, just like an adulterous wife. We get to chapter 14, and we will have that promise of ultimate restoration. Chapter 4, verse 1, Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. That's the language of a, of a legal lawsuit. Because there is no unfaithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. That's the problem. And so God brings forth his case. He's dragging Israel into court, as it were. Verse 2, there is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Yet no one finds fault, and let none offer refute, uh, re reproof. I'm sorry. Uh, for your people are like those who contend with the priests. So you will stumble by day, and the prophet also will stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. Now he's, speaking to, he's not speaking to an individual, individual priest. He is speaking to the nation of Israel, who themselves are to be a nation of priests, but now they are going to be rejected from that role. A priest is one who represents the people to God. Israel was supposed to represent the human race to God. But Israel falls short. So God says, I'm going to reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. For I delight, and we're coming to chapter 6 now, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. You know, uh, that, that term covenant, you don't see it until Genesis chapter 6. But I have suggested in the past that that the idea of the covenant is there earlier than Genesis chapter 6 goes all the way back to creation. And, and we get that right here in Hosea chapter 6 verse 7. Like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. There they have dealt treacherously against me. We get to chapter 11 verse 1. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Now we, we are perhaps used to hearing that verse as it relates to Jesus, because it is quoted in Matthew chapter 2, and it does echo something of Jesus. But when we look at the context of the passage, it has a much more immediate context. You see, how does the New Testament treat this passage? The New Testament looks at it and says, just like Israel came out of, of Egypt, so, so Jesus, uh, in his early life, you know, when he was still a child, he was taken, and then came out of Egypt. That is how the New Testament treats this passage. But when we look at it in its context, notice when Israel was the youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they called them, the more they went up, uh, they went from them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. When, when in the context of this, Hosea is actually speaking of the nation of Israel, how the nation of Israel uh, was given birth, really. The nation came to be, being brought out of Egypt. It was brought out as a, as a ready nation, ready to be planted in the land. And yet, and yet, even though God had given them that kind of birth, that kind of deliverance, they were an unfaithful people, and they weren't sacrificing 
to other gods. I led them with cords of a man, he says, with bonds of love, and I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws, and I bent down and fed them. They will not return to the land of Egypt, but they're going to be taken off the land. But Assyria, he will be their king because they re refuse to listen to me. I'm not going to send them back from, to, from where they originally came, but I'm going to remove them to a different land. And this is speaking of the Assyrian uh, captivity, the captivity of the northern kingdom of Israel that begins in 721 B.C. Assyria then is going to come against uh, Israel and will carry them off into captivity. Return, O Israel, we get to chapter 14. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses, nor will we say again, Our God, to the work of our hands. For in you the orphan finds mercy. And God says, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from them. It has been satisfied. Now next we're going to look at the book of Joel. Uh, the book of Joel has the, uh, carries the idea, which a number of books, that, that we're going to see this there, but the theme of the, of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. Notice we start the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. We're not told when it took place. In fact, there are some scholars that think maybe the book of Joel was written after the Babylonian captivity. We're going to treat it here as though it's before that captivity, um, but frankly, we just don't know. Verse 2 starts off, Hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it, and let your sons tell their sons, and their sons the next generation. What is it? What had taken place in the book of Joel? Here it is. What the nine locusts has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. What the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. In other words, there is a locust plague that is described in terms of wave after wave after wave coming against the land. A locust plague is a terrible thing to see. They come, they're basically just giant grasshoppers. They come and they eat everything, any crop, any tree, any leaf. It is just gobbled up and disappears. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion. Now we're speaking figuratively speaking. They don't, they're not giant fangs like a lion. But its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has the fangs of a lion. The, the point is that they come and they destroy, just as if a, a herd of lions had come. Now this brings up the question, are natural disasters, we speak of natural disasters, are natural disasters natural. I live in South Florida um, and right next to the Caribbean where we are used to seeing natural disasters. So a few years ago down in Haiti we had we saw earthquakes down there. When we have tor uh, tornadoes or hurricanes or earthquakes or perhaps man-made disasters. The question before the house are these from God are these just are these just the price of living on planet Earth? The book of Joel answers that question, and Joel says, "Look, when bad things happen, like locusts, and we see this this group of locusts coming in chapter one, um, and they are alluded to there in chapter two. We turn our, turn the page there in chapter two, verse one. We see the army of the Lord, and it's not entirely clear. Are we still talking about locusts?" But the point is, if you look at the locust plague and all you see is bugs, you've missed the point. Because God has sent these locusts as a judgment against Jerusalem. And so we started off in chapter 1. There's a, you know, a, a locust plague that's present uh, and that illustrates maybe a different sort of army. Maybe not. Maybe it's the same army. Uh, but in chapter 2, there's, uh, th there's a call to sound the alert because here comes the army. 
Uh, and is it more bugs or is it people? Is it Nebuchadnezzar? Is it Babylon? Again, we're not entirely sure. And then in chapter 2, verse 12, there is a call to repentance. Here it is. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Who knows? Remember that who knows principle? I think we've talked about that in the past. That when we come to the prophecies, Sometimes we're not entirely sure, you know, these are conditional prophecies, and even when they are not stated as conditional, there might be conditions, who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and, not a, and a drink offering for the Lord your God. So, verse 15, blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants, let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of his bridal out of her bridal chamber. So a call to repentance, and then after that we read about a promise, a promise of the coming of the Spirit of the Lord. Now notice before chapters one and first part of chapter two had to do with the city of Jerusalem. This is going to actually take place there, but it will have its focus, not just the events in Jerusalem. It will be looking forward and looking out to all the nations. And so this is something that takes place, at least from Joel's day, in the future. For us, we look back to uh, when the Spirit of the Lord was given on the day of Pentecost. It's described in the Bible in Acts chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, 29, it will come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, columns of smoke, the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Notice, uh, there's coming in the day of the Lord, but before it comes, these other things are going to take place. Now, notice the prophecy, and then we'll also look at the fulfillment. In the prophecy, we have God's Spirit's going to be poured out, uh, sons and daughters are going to prophesy, dreams and visions are going to be given, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, and then the sun would be darkened, the moon into blood. Think about when those things took place. God's Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2, where, where it came upon those who were gathered together in Jerusalem, in a very visible and vibrant way. You have men and women who are prophesying. You have dreams and visions all throughout the book of Acts that are given. The blood of Jesus and the uh, sign of tongues of fire are given. You know, blood and fire. Uh, I guess when there's fire, where there's smoke, there's fire, vapor of smoke. Uh, and think about this. The sun darkened. Where, when was the sun darkened? We saw it, the crucifixion of Jesus. When Jesus was upon the cross, the sun became darkened, just as the prophecy of Joel had promised. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord had said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. The way of escape begins in Jerusalem with a cross just outside of Jerusalem and a, and a crucified Messiah hanging upon it. And that message goes out from Jerusalem to the whole earth so that today there is hardly a language where that message is not spoken. We come to the end of the book. Notice we had the Spirit of the Lord, that reference to nations. And chapter, th chapter 3 has a picture of judgment, and there were promises, and, and I think probably the, the ultimate and final judgment is pictured there.
Now let's talk about the book of Amos. Amos is the prophet of social injustice. Amos chapter 1 verse 1, the words of Amos who was among the sheep herders of, from Tekoa. Now Tekoa is a bit south of Bethlehem. So he's from the, the, the land of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, that, that southern kingdom. But he's going to be sent both to Judah but also to the northern kingdom of Israel. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherd, sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned in the vision concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Of course, that doesn't really help us. We don't know exactly when the earthquake was, but we, we can pin about when, when those kings reigned. And we read about Amos, when we get to chapter 7, verses 14 and 15, Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman, and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. So, so Amos is not a prophet, but God comes to him and gives a message and, and says, You're going to be my mouthpiece. You go, you go tell him these things. Amos says, Yes, sir. And he goes and he begins prophesying. So here's Amos. He's from Tekoa, south of Jerusalem. His prophecy, though, is directed primarily toward the northern kingdom of Israel. Even though he's from the southern kingdom of Judah, he's prophesying primarily to the northern kingdom of Israel. He said, The Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice, and the shepherd's pasture ground mourns, and the summit of Carmel drives up. Notice the language here. It is exactly the same phrase that we see at the end of the book of Joel. At the end of the book of Joel, we read, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And here Amos begins with that phrase. It's almost as though Amos picks up where Joel leaves off. It is for that reason we're studying them in this particular order. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four I will not revoke its punishment because they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. Uh, Damascus, that's that, that pagan city north of Israel and they had come and, and invaded portions of the land of Israel and now they're, it's told that they're going to be punished. I will also break the, uh, the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the valley of Aven and him who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. So the people of Aram will go exile to Kur. Aram is the land in which Damascus is. Today we call it Syria. Its ancient name was, was Aram. And God is pronouncing judgment upon Damascus and on the country of Aram. So, for three transgressions and for four, notice we had this, this first oracle against Damascus. And I, you can imagine the Israelites, as they hear of this, they say, Oh good, we don't really care for Damascus. They came down and invaded us and took them some property, and that wasn't very nice of them. I'm so glad God is going to get them. And then a bit later, uh, still in chapter 1, Amos says, for three transgressions and for four, I have this against you, Gaza. Gaza, those are those nasty old Philistines down uh, on the, in the, what we call today the Gaza Strip. Uh, we don't like them. We're so glad that God is going to judge them too. For three transgressions and for four, I have this against you, Tyre. Tyre is uh, that ocean-going city it's, uh, where they build the big ships, merchants, and, and they have... Uh, um, colonies all over the Mediterranean, but they're a group of Baal worshippers, and, and the Israelites say, oh good, you know, not that we're really mad at Tyre, but, but God's going to judge them, and they probably ought to get judged as well, and, and that's fine. For three transgressions and for four, I have this against you, Edom. Now, Edom was a little closer to home because the Edomites uh, are descendants of Esau, who was related to Jacob, who was related to the sons of Israel. So these are sort of distant cousins. But we don't really like Edom because uh, when we were marching through the promised land or through the wilderness, we wanted to get the promised land. They said you cannot uh, pass through our territory, and we had to make this big detour. So good God, God really had to judge Edom for three transgressions and for four. I have this against you, Ammon. Uh, both Ammon and the next one he's going to mention is Moab. Um, both Ammon and Moab; those were descendants of Lot. 
And these had also been more or less traditional enemies of Israel in the past. And so, good, God is going to judge them. And now God gets very personal for three transgressions and for four I have this against you, Jerusalem, Judah. Wow, now we're really getting close because Judah, that was, had been part of Israel in the days of Saul, David, and Solomon. No longer, now there are two separate nations, but this is very close to home. And finally, uh, Amos told to say, for three transgressions and for four, I have this against you, Israel. And so notice he's gone ar around them and, and all the other nations, and now he comes to focus his anger upon Israel. So chapters 1 and 2, we have that, that catchphrase repeated uh, seven times, uh, eight times, I'm sorry, um, against Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, Moab, Judah, and finally Israel. Then in chapters 3 through 6, we have specifically those judgments against Israel. It begins in chapter 3, where God says, you know, you were my chosen people. And because of that, I'm going to judge you all the more harshly. After all you are more responsible because you had my truth and you didn't keep my truth. Hear this word. He comes to chapter 4 now. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Now, Bashan is that area to the east of uh, the Jordan River, still, still in Israel, still in their territory. Uh, remember the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh had taken this particular, these particular properties. Hear this a uh, word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands. Notice we're not talking about literal cows. We're describing the wives of Israel, of the Israelites in the northern kingdom. We're describing them in, in terms of being cows. Who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. And there's a judgment against the wives. Why against the wives? Because their appetites, their desires, their requests of their husband have been such that it drove the greed that led to the, the improper treatment of the poor. We come to chapter 4, verse 2. The Lord has sworn by his holiness, Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. You wanted ornaments, but instead you're going to get the nastiest sort of ornaments, a fish hook through the lip or through the nose. And, and we know historically wh that when the Assyrians came against Israel, that's exactly what they did because they, they present it, they picture it on their wall paintings with them hauling their captives with hooks through their noses and through their lips. Verse 6, But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and lack of bread in all your places, and yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. That's going to be the, the continuing refrain throughout this chapter. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there, there were still three months until harvest, then I would send rain on one city, and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on, while the part not rained on would dry up. Uh, th that's echoes of the promises of Leviticus chapter 26. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. That's the second time we've seen it. We keep reading. I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and, fig and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me. That's the third time, declares the Lord. He goes on to say, I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword, along with your captured horses. I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me. Four times, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze, yet you have not returned to me. Five times we see that continuing phrase. When you hear that, you're supposed to remember something. We alluded to it when we first started our, our study of the Minor Prophets, that back in Leviticus 26, 
there are those five cycles of discipline, each one worse, each one saying, and if you don't return to me, I'll curse you seven times more. And he says that five times, just like here, five times. He says, yet you have not returned to me. I did all those things to make you return, and you wouldn't do it. You would not return to me. And it is calling to mind the curses of breaking the covenant that had been given back in Leviticus chapter 26. Five times we say that continuing refrain. Five times. And the worst, because you have not returned to me, I will take you out of the land. So, chapter 4, you have not returned. Chapter 5, there is the call, seek me that you may live not five times. This, uh, that'll in, it's in chapter 5, but it will be given. That statement will be made three times, uh, again and again and again. Uh, seek me that you may live. And finally, you remember how in chapter 4 we spoke to the women? Now we speak against the men in chapter 6, and there is a judgment given to them as well. In chapter 7, there are five visions of judgment. First, uh, locusts, which reminds us again of the book of Joel. Uh, there is a vision of fire that Amos has. There is a vision of a plumb line. That's a, a, a string with a heavy weight at the bottom that would be used to measure the straightness of, of, a, of a wall. And the Lord says, I am taking my plumb line. I'm measuring up the land of Israel to see if they are straight or crooked. And they're very crooked. Uh, they need to come down. There's a vision of ripe fruit, ripe for the plucking, ripe, ripe for the, the taking and eating. And, and Israel is going to be plucked up and carried away like a basket of ripe fruit. There's a vision of the Lord by the altar. Sort of reminds me of, of Revelation chapter 6 where I have souls under the altar that are praying to the Lord. And when you had uh, a picture of the altar, now it could be the, pic the altar is a picture of the brazen altar where the sacrifices would be made, but it seems instead that this is perhaps the altar of incense, which was the place that, that when you put incense upon the altar, that was the time of prayer. And so it represented the prayers of God's people going up, and this picture of the Lord by the altar is perhaps a picture of that. We get to chapter 9, and there is a, there's a promise of restoration, first of Israel, and then of the nations, and finally forever, because uh, there will be an eternal restoration of God's people. Chapter 9, verse 11. In that day, God says, I will raise up the fallen booth of David. Now, the fallen booth, the fallen, we could translate the fallen tabernacle of David, the fallen tent of David, the fallen dwelling of David. Remember, once the Israelites and uh, northern kingdom and then southern kingdom are taken away ca into captivity, there will be no reigning line in David. Even though they come back into the land, there will be no descendants of David sitting upon the throne. And yet God says, in that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David, will wall up its breaches, I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the nations who were called by my name declares the Lord who does this. There's coming a day, God says, when I'm going to restore the fallen booth, the fallen tent, the fallen banner, I guess we could say, of David. And that's speaking of Jesus. In fact, in Acts chapter 15, the apostle, uh, actually I started to say the apostle, it's James the Lord's brother, quotes this passage and says that refers to Jesus and it refers to us as well. Because notice verse 12, and all the nations who were called by that name. And in the context of that chapter, James is saying, you see the nations are going to be called by the Lord's name, and so therefore it is, an, it is appropriate for them to come in and be a part of the church. That was the big question that was being asked in Acts, in Acts 15. Um, can Gentiles come into the church without being circumcised first? Do they have to become Jewish first? And James says, no, they don't. And here's the proof. It, the proof is given in this passage in Amos chapters 9 verses 11 and 12.